Well, everybody's in here. Why don't we get started with a praise song to the Lord, Great is the Lord. to see you all out today and uh, we're looking forward to uh, maybe a little more snow they say this afternoon so just make note of that then also make note no evening service tonight um, we'll let you be with your families and friends tonight right, let's pray father god we do thank you for your great love to us sending jesus to be our savior and it's through him we ask you today to help us lord to love you back to love you more and more, Lord, to love each other. For we know in love, your law is fulfilled. We just pray for each of these requests, Lord, that you would show your love to them by your assistance in their recovery and your, or your mercy in their misery. Lord, help them, we pray. And also through our love as each one here would seek to help one another with prayers and Lord in pursuing their help. Just speak to our hearts as we continue to worship. Help us Lord as we listen for your voice in the message. And then Lord if there's anyone that's not saved Today might be their day of salvation. Just bless this whole day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There will never be a sweeter story, story of the Savior's love divine, love that brought him from the realms of glory. Just to save a sinful soul like mine Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful, wonderful oh, Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is to me About the stars, the universe around me Reaching to the farthest all away Saving, keeping love, it was that found me That is why my heart can truly say Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful it is to me Love be under whom and comprehend Love of God in Christ, how can it be? This will be my theme and never ending. 
great redeeming love of Calvary. Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful it is to me? Well, there's hearts on the screen. I'm wearing a red sweater. And all of her songs about love today. Just a hint for the guys tomorrow. <laughs> I don't know what tomorrow's about, but you know, I'm trying to help you out a little bit there, so <laughs> let's find the key six rhyme in. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love and the good he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus Lee, Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee. When I remember that Jesus loves me, I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great King, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. My Father is omnipotent. And that you can't deny A God of might and miracles Tis written in the sky He took a miracle To put the stars in place He took a miracle took a miracle of love and grace. Throughout His glory has been shown, we still can fully see the wonders of His mighty throne. Throughout eternity, it took a to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang this world in space. But when He saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love Above all powers, above all things, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were there before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, 
above all wonders the world has ever known above all wealth and treasures of the earth here's the way to measure what you're Above all powers. Oh, did I not have the second verse? Oh, I'm sorry about that. I thought I put it in there. That was my bad. I love the first. Let's do the chorus now. Crucified, lay behind a stone. You live to die, rejected and alone like a rose, trampled on the ground. This is one of my favorite songs. I sing it a lot. I just didn't bring it into our church today. But today you'll hear one of my favorites. I get teared up every time I sing this one. <clears throat> Sorry. Bite the cold this month. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail-pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow for all. We crown you now with many crowns. You reign victorious. High and lifted up, Jesus, Son of God, darling of heaven, crucified. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Son of God, the darling of heaven crucified, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the
beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> On that resurrection morning, when the redeemed are gathering in, I'll be in that royal number when they call my name, when they all join in and sing hallelujah to the king i'll join with a joyful sound lord here i am well here i am here i am i'm the one the shepherd left the fold and found there were ninety and nine but he left the fold to find one little lost lamb and here i am Think about this now. When old Gabriel blows the trumpet and we rise up in the air, in less time than a split second, we'll be changed from here to there, where there'll be no grief or pain, perfect peace and joy shall reign. Home at last I shall proclaim, Lord, here I am. Well, here I am, here I am. I'm the one the shepherd left the fold and found. Well, there were ninety and nine, but he left the fold to find. One little lost lamb, and here I am. Well, there were ninety and nine, but he left the fold to find. One little lost lamb he was looking for. One little lost lamb he found that. One little lost lamb, and here I am. Take your Bible and join me in First Thessalonians chapter 4 this morning. By the way, we do welcome visitors today, amen? If you haven't yet signed the guest book, we welcome you to do that, and we want to keep in touch with you. We're glad to have visitors come today. And uh, new kids and new families are always great to see around here. Amen. Thanking God for that. Um, one of the things uh, that um, I want to let you know of is I know some new folks have joined our faith life. We have a dedicated web uh, site called Faith Light that if you send your e if you give me your email, we will send you a an invite, and you can join that. Uh, it's Clinton Road Bible Baptist Church, and you'll get updates all the time of what's happening, uh, prayer requests. But something new that I want to do, uh, it might help you here, um, is to put the sermon notes on a faith life. So you'll be able to get the full outline and you won't miss any points. Well, Paul had taught in chapter 3 about standing, remember? We said that... Uh, they got saved in chapter 1 and turned to God from idols. He shared the gospel with them as he started the church in Thessalonica. Then he's trying to help them to crawl and he's helping them to stand up. We saw how that, that 
Being a Christian is a new birth. And then you begin to grow and, and you want to help them to, to be able to stand. And they are, they're, they're wobbly. Christian, little kids are wobbly. And they fall down a lot. And they, 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 they're messy. <laughs> they cry a lot. Uh, they, they, they do something else that's not a pleasant odor. <laughs> and, uh, and all of that. And it's a likening to that that we are trying to help each other to stand. And then we begin to be a family. We all have different jobs in the family. We all are working together to make sure that the family has what it needs and that everybody's needs are met. So he talked about that. Now the last two chapters, he's going to give some more practical uh, information about being a family, being a church, being established, being able to stand, being able to walk. This morning he, tell, he, he uses the word walk. And, and you've probably heard the term, how is your walk with the Lord? And it's a daily life of living a life, walking with God in fellowship with God, doing the will of God and the work of God. In the section of the book, Paul instructs the church about how to live to please God, he says in verse 1. To please God. They know how, but Paul wants to encourage them to do it more and more. See that in verse 1, more and more. Then he says it again in verse 10. Increase more and more. He's wanting them to keep going, doing it more and more. And he's going to talk them about walking in harmony and walking in holiness and, and walking in honesty, laboring, and then walking in hope. He's going to talk about all these things. Let's read the chapter together and note how we can walk to please the Lord. Finally, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. That's the second time he said this. Through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel his body, in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of or defraud or do wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given to us his holy spirit. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God. To love one another. And indeed you do so toward all, all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. That you also aspire to lead a quiet life. To mind your own business. And to work with your own hands. As we commanded you. That you, here it is again, walk properly toward those who are outside. That means unsaved, unbelievers, not Christians, not in the church. Walk properly toward those who are outside. And that you lack nothing. 
But I would not have you to be ignorant or misinformed, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. And we're going to see that means those Christians who die, it's called sleep. Lest you sorrow as others, other people, who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him, Jesus, will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be got up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Pray once more. Lord, again, help us as we open your word, put it on the table that people will come and die. Each one will receive something today from yourself. It'll strengthen them. It'll encourage them. It'll exhort them. And then if, if anybody's not sure if when this happens, and this is going to happen, they will be left behind. May today they see how they can make sure they go when you come. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. First point that I have you go back to is walking not in the passion of lust, verses 1 through 8. He says, if you want to have a walk with God and you want to uh, please the Lord, and again, there's a lot about pleasing God in this chapter. We have to walk not in the passions of lusts. He mentions uh, these things in, in verse 3 as their sexual immorality. Um, possessing your body in in sanctification and honor. But I want you to see from verse 1, first, these are exhortations in the Lord Jesus. These are not suggestions or things that Paul made up. They're not his ideas. He got what he got from God himself. We already saw that he received the gospel, not from men, but from Jesus himself, who appeared to him resurrected. And that these letters are not just words on a page that some guy wrote. These are called the holy inspired written word of God. And so what he's telling these people is not a suggestion. As a matter of fact, we'll see that in a second here. They're not suggestions. <laughs> They're commandments. And what he's going to share with them is that walking to please the Lord, first of all, is what he is commanding them. It's from the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, look back there at verse 4. He said, But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests the hearts. You know, you're, you're, you're living right now to please somebody. Most people live to please themselves. Some live to please their spouse. Some live to please their friends. But a lot of people just live to please themselves. Ask yourself, who am I living to please? Who do I want to please? For the believer, the first and foremost love of your life, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart. You should seek and want to please the Lord the most. How do you know if you're pleasing to him? Well, how do you know if you're pleasing your spouse? How do you know if you're pleasing your father, your dad? Well, 
You get to know your dad. You get to know your spouse. You know what they like. You know what makes them happy. You know what they, they need to feel love. Some people, the only way they feel love is by what you do for them. A deed, like flowers. Hint, hint. Some, it may be not flowers, but a hug. Some, it might be, remember, making the bed. Whoosh. If you listen to last week's sermon, you'll get that. Some people, they feel loved if you cuddle. What is it that makes God feel loved? He said, if you keep my commandments, know that you love me. Because my commandments aren't grievous. They're for your good. They're for your good. Exhortations in the Lord, walking to please God. Then walking in the will of God, verse 3. Look there. For this is the will of God. Your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. The word is pornea in the Greek. And it includes all kinds of misconduct when it comes to our, our bodies. It is important. Again, let me just, just point this out. All of the Old Testament is written with these laws, these commands. Again, he, he, he said these are commands. Um, from the Lord. You, you know the commands we gave you. You want to walk in the will of God. You want to walk next in, in the commands of, of the Lord Jesus, verse 2. You want to walk in the commands. Again, they're not suggestions, they're commands. These are exhortations from the Lord Jesus himself. These are commands from the Lord himself. And, and this idea of commandments, the Old Testament. You know, I've read it and studied it and it's hard to read. It's difficult to see all the things there that God says are unclean. <laughs> I mean, I love pork chops. God said in the Old Testament, don't eat them. It's unclean. You know one of the animals that spoils the quickest is what? Pork. Why do you think God put up all those laws in the Old Testament? Is it because he was totally against you eating pork? Now in the New Testament, he said all meats are to be received with thanksgiving. You know, some people still don't eat pork, or you know, because of conviction. Some people don't wear jewelry because of convictions. They don't wear pants because of an Old Testament regulation. But I want you to understand that all those Old Testament regulations were not just for God making up rules that he wanted to keep. He wasn't trying to just make things up that would make it hard for you. <laughs> he was making things that would, would help you. That would keep your health. Um, people he called unclean were, were for reasons that other people wouldn't get sick and die. Plague. That plagues wouldn't come. That, that terrible diseases wouldn't come. You've heard the term godliness is, uh, cleanliness is next to godliness. You've heard that, right? There's some truth, and that's not in the Bible, but I think there's some truth to it. We're learning a lot about cleanliness and washing our hands today, aren't we? Why is it that, that that is such an issue back in the Bible days? Because I'm telling you, if we have problems with plague today, you imagine what it was like before for refrigeration and antibiotics and doctors. And you just think of it. Just think of God as trying to make these rules. Why do you set rules at home? Because you like to make your kids miserable. <laughs> Got them with this one. Can't wait till they break that rule so I can get the switch after them. That's what my ma always did, I felt. You know, it's like, well, my ma, she set the rules and she wanted, she whipped me with the switch and then I had to go get it. And if it wasn't a good one, I had, and it fell apart the first swing, I had to go get another one. Did she do that because she wanted to, she enjoyed me being miserable and she enjoyed hurting me? Every time my mother whipped me, my mother cried. 
Why do you think God did all those things in the Old Testament? Because he was, he was loving you. He knows that if you, if you, I don't think there's any children here, if you have sex with an animal, you're going to have some disease. You're going to disrupt things if you have sodomy. And I looked it up today. You look it up. What does it mean? What did it used to mean? A lot of the diseases that happen are because God said, don't do that. Premarital sex and all of it. People today, they don't think anything about premarital sex or adultery or anal, or whatever. Yeast. I know that's gross and I know that's awful and I might even cut that out, but <laughs> I'm telling you, the reason God set all these laws was because they will lead to death. Disease plague and judgment the Bible does even tell us that commandments in the Lord walking to possess your person he said in verse 2 your vessel you should all be able to control your passions walking not in the passion but in purity number 2 verses 3 through 5 look at 2nd Timothy chapter 2 verse 21 2 Timothy 2.21 Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, talks about sinfulness, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, that simply means set apart for God's use, sanctified and useful for the master, Prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lusts. Pursue righteousness. Again, I don't want to labor on it, but it, it says in Hebrews 13, 4, Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. And again, it's not because he wants to be mean. Not because he wants to make people's lives miserable. It's because he knows that that lifestyle destroys the home, destroys your health. It'll even lead to death prematurely. And it will lead to dysfunction. All kinds of problems that families have and kids have and all kinds of things. And so that's why there's all the laws against incest and and, and sodomy and all the rest. It's not because God wants to be a meanie. He wants your life to be meaningful. Walking not in the passions. We're not going to take the time, I guess, but, but there's, and, and it's not in my slides, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homo homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were, past tense, were some of you, but you are washed, you were sanctified, you were justified by... In the name of the Lord Jesus, by the Spirit of God, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all. I will, I will not be brought under the power of any. You're to, you're to be able to possess your, your vessel, control your passions. Granted, there are, there are people who have identity crisis. They don't feel like a guy. They feel like a girl. There's girls that feel like like guys instead of girls. There are all kinds of, of attractions, but it doesn't make it right. I might be attracted to another woman, but if I'm married, I don't indulge that feeling or that attraction or that, I, I, I say no to it over and over and over if, if it's a problem. The Bible's telling us that we need to control these passions. And, and uh, because we're to be walking with the Lord. Let her see call of God in holiness, verses 6 through 8, back in our text. 
the call of God. Sexual immorality defrauds another, verse 6 says. It defrauds another person. In the Old Testament, he said, don't cover your neighbor's wife. Yeah, but she's prettier than mine. So what? <laughs> you married her. You love her. Not because of what she looks like. By the way, did you know that her looks are going to change? Your looks are going to change. I don't look like I did. I put my picture up of what I looked like when I was 18, and everybody goes, Woo! Wow! I see why your wife wanted to marry you. You were good looking. Yeah, now I, I, I'm not so good looking anymore. But you know what? My wife still loves me. She loves me. Amazing grace. And you know what? I still love her. I love her more than, as a matter of fact, I don't even think I knew what love was when I married her. I, I think I was still attracted to her. I'm still attracted to her, but I'm attracted to her in a different way now. And I'd much rather have this way than the other way. Because all things change the older you get, <laughs> right? And so you just keep loving each other. And you, you say no to those passions. It doesn't mean that you're, you know, God's going to get you because you've had that feeling or that attraction or that look. You, you know, again, being tempted is not the sin. Being, being tempted is not the sin. Indulging in that sin, going forward with it, thinking about it, that's where it becomes sin. And when you, when you want your neighbor's wife and you, you win her heart and then you... You, you divorce, they divorce, and you get her. I'm telling you what, then you've got some problems with God, especially if you're a believer. <laughs> I don't know if believers can, can really get away with that. <laughs> Number two, sexual immorality defiles your, yourself. You probably heard in, in health class that when you have relations with somebody, you're not just having relations with that person. If you're promiscuous, you're having relations with all the people they've had relationships with. And you get back to the disease part. The STDs and all that. And this isn't a class where I'm trying to teach, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying that God is the one who set these rules in place. And, and it's not because he, he wants to, you know, restrict you from enjoying and, and who you love and all that. It's because he knows that there are certain behaviors that are, not only are they wrong, but they, the reason they're wrong is they are not from God. They're from the devil. And what's his desire? To steal, to kill, to destroy. 1 Corinthians, flee, for, flee fornication. Every sin that a man does is outside his body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Sexual immorality defrauds another. Sexual immorality defiles ourselves. And then third, sexual immorality dishonors God. Verse 8. He who rejects this doesn't reject man, but God. These are not my commands. These are not my exhortations. These are God's. This is God's idea. God's idea was a man and a woman. It wasn't, my, it wasn't Eve and Steve. It was Adam and Eve. It was God's idea that... It should be a man and a woman for all of their life till death parted them. That's God's idea. Now, I know God still has mercy. Look in the New Testament. They got a woman and they, they trapped her and she was found taken in adultery. They threw him down in front of Jesus and said, okay, what do you say? Should we stone him? Moses said to stone him. If he just said stone him, they said, oh, well, I thought you were all about love and forgiveness. What's going on? If he said, let her go, you know, we'll just overlook this one. Then, oh, well, you can't be of God because God said, you know, the adulterer is going to be stoned to death. Probably could have said, well, where's the man? He took him in the very act. The Old Testament says put them both to death. What did Jesus do? He rode on the ground, maybe some of their sins. Then he stood up. And they kept asking him, well, what do we do? Are we going to stone her or what? And he said, let the one that's without sin cast the first stone. That's a little different from the law. The law was the person who was making the accusation. 
they were the one to cast the first stone and then everybody else until the person was stoned to death. Jesus changed it a little bit. He said, you who don't have any sin, you throw the first stone. The oldest guy drops the rock. Because he, he's lived a long time and he knows he's got lots of sin. Left. Got down to the last guy and he dropped the rock. And Jesus looked at her and he said, Where's your accusers? Lord. Jesus looked down. The only righteous one that could have thrown a rock. Sinless. Could have thrown a rock. Smashed her head in and killed her. Been just. Neither do I. Go and sin no more. You look all throughout the scriptures and you'll see that God is a God of love. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of forgiveness. He set up all those laws to protect us and our families and our health and all of that. And, and church has made a difference in the world. You go wherever there's not the gospel and not the word of God and not the church of God. And you'll see paganism and, and you'll see the most vile and disgusting and, and people who have no hygiene in their health and their life, they die and their, their mortality rate is so much higher. Why? Because they don't have the Bible. They don't have Christ. And they're living like the devil and like their own desires want. And, and, it, and it destroys civilizations. Wherever a missionary goes and he gets them in the book, I'm telling you, the wives are treated good. They don't beat them up anymore. They're not... They're not adulterers and, 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 and baby killers. and they, they, they're, they're blessed. Everywhere Christianity has gone has been blessed. Number two, walking in the purity of love. Not only walking in the passion, walking not in the passion of lust. You get control of that. God will give you the power. You can't do it on your own, but his spirit will help you. Sanctification is where, where you just make yourself available and God gives you the power. He makes you holy. You can't make yourself holy. You can't keep the Old Testament law. Number two, walking in the power of love. Verses 9 and 10. He says... Concerning brotherly love, verse 9, it, it's taught of God. Verse 9, it's taught of God. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love. For one another. Somebody said, how many commandments are there? And, and the, you know, the know-it-all said, well, there's, there's ten. But some little kid said, there's eleven. <laughs> eleven. And then he quoted that one that I just quoted. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. You know, the, Jesus said, if you, if you will love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and your neighbor as yourself, you will have kept all of the law. You'll be pleasing to God. You, you will do, you will live right. If you treat, if, if you just love your enemies and love your neighbor and love God, and God defines what love is, He defines it in the Bible. We don't have to take the world's definition and ooh, free love, oh, love, peace, dope. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, it's, it's God's love. Walk in the purity of this love. It's taught of God. I don't even need to teach you, he said. God taught you. You, you yourselves are taught of God. See it there, verse 9? To love one another. Again, I've seen where the gospel has gone into where tribes... It, it, that that they they their, the women were were literally you you could beat your wife and and really even beat her to death and you're you're there's no problem there. When the gospel comes, they they want to love their wife. They 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 find out what the Bible says about love and marriage, and they they start to live it. And God enables them to live it, and it brings civility. It brings harmony. 
harmony. It brings all kinds of great things, the kind of love that God's talking about. It's, it's taught of God, and then B, it, it's toward the brethren. It's toward the brethren. Indeed, you do toward all the brethren in Macedonia. Paul wrote elsewhere how much this little church who was poor, persecuted, paupers, how they helped other people and other churches and other families. I read a story this week of a, of a Jewish legend. These two Jewish men lived adjacent to each other on, on, on properties. And the one man had a large family and a wife, and the other man lived all alone. They both had their farm. And the man who had all of his um, children and family, he woke up one night and he thought about his neighbor. He thought, you know what? My neighbor's over there all by himself. He doesn't have anybody around him to help him and to love him. I'm going to take some of my sheaves over and put it in his field. Got up in the night and he gathered some of his sheaves and he's making his way over to his neighbor's house and neighbor's farm in the, in the night. You know what? The other neighbor was awake in the night. He was thinking, you know what? I, the one who had nobody, he's thinking, you know what? My neighbor's got a wife and all these kids. Imagine he's going to need some help gather up some of my sheaves and I'm going to take them over to him. So he got up in the night and he loads his wagon and he's making his way over to the neighbor's field and they both met at the line. Both met at the property line. And they saw each other, told the story to each other and embraced each other. And the legend goes on, I don't know that it's true or anything, but the legend goes on that later when the Jews built the temple, that that was the very point of the altar of sacrifice. It's, whether it's true or not, it tells the story of love, doesn't it? It's where you love your neighbor. You love your enemy. Well, he doesn't love me. It's not about that. We don't know what, what's in the heart of everybody else, but we know what God wants in our hearts. Amen? Walk in this. It, it's taught of God. It's toward the brethren. 1 John 3, 14 and 15 says, We know that we have passed from death unto life. Why? Because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life dwelling in him, abiding in him. They will know we're Christians because we love each other. We forgive each other. We put up with each other. We fight. Do families fight? Oh, no, not families that love each other. They fight. They fight, they bicker, they, they might even get in a fist fight. You know what? I, I've seen this. Guys, they can get in a fist fight, and then the next thing you know, they got their arms around each other grinning at the camera. You know, they're happy, but just watch gun smoke a little bit. They'll fight. Women? Ooh. Watch out. I don't know if they ever, you know, once, you, once women fight, I don't know if they ever can become friends again after that. Guys, they can beat each other up and believe, man, that was a good fight, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I, I love you, man. <laughs> love, love is able to have some fights. I know there are, there are women who, who can. I, I make a joke between dogs and cats and men and women. I do that. But men are like dogs. You know, you beat them to death and they come back. <laughs> Cats, like, get away from me. Oh, I want some food, though. That's the truth. I got cats that I thought loved me. Nope, as soon as you feed them, they won't come and sit on your lap no more. It's like, I got what I want. Get away from me. I've kind of get sidetracked here. but It's fun, isn't it? I can cut that out. Cut it out. Walk in purity of love toward all brethren. And love, you can get along even after you've gotten along. <laughs> Number three, walking properly in the provision of labor. Verse 11 and 12. 
walking properly in the provision of labor. He says, I want you to aspire to lead a quiet life. This means, letter A, being faithful, not frantic. Verse 11, a quiet life. It has the meaning of, of um, restful. It has the idea of uh, settled, undisturbed. Have you noticed that life is kind of frantic? A lot of times it's frantic. We can't help it. It's, it's the, the way the world is. It's just a crazy world. And the idea that, that we're to try to live a, a, a quiet life comes from 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10 through 12. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, that if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Not those who are, now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness. There it is, in quietness. And eat their own bread. Eat their own bread. What did he say in this verse? Verse 11, mind your own business. <laughs> Nobody wanted to say it. Mind your own business, preacher. <laughs> You're meddling. But that's what happened. That's what happens when he's going to talk in just a minute about the rapture, about people who died. This church thought that the people who they loved who got saved and died, that they are missing this rapture. They're missing the coming of the Lord. They're missing something in, in the coming of Christ. And they also, some of them had the idea, you know what we're going to do? We're going to sell everything we have and we're going to go hide in the mountains and wait for, for Jesus to come. Have you ever heard that before? Have you ever heard of somebody saying, okay, the Lord's coming in the year 2000, Y2K. I know he's coming. I'm telling you, he's coming. So we'll just get rid of all this clutter. We'll sell all that we got. And we'll just wait around for him. And what was happening was the Lord didn't come on Y2K. Did he? I hope not. He didn't come. The people who sold their houses and moved into the mountains, you know what? Now they're saying, oh, we're starving to death. What's going on? Paul is trying to correct a wrong idea. And a wrong idea can carry over today. Do you know why socialism doesn't work? <laughs> because eventually you run out of other people's money. <laughs> Get that in a minute. You've heard it before. All these things that God said you need to hey, make sure your society is set up on. Make sure that you have the home in its proper place and sex in its proper place. Make sure that you have love of your neighbor in its right place. Make sure that you're, you're walking properly and providing for your own family and working with your hands and, and doing uh, hard work. Everybody taking care of his own family. He even told the church... When they all sold their property, you know, the, later on they had to have help, didn't they? And they had to get them established again. God saw that and he knew that and he probably used that to help the church get started. But the idea is that he didn't want people to just quit their jobs and live as a commune somewhere. He wants you to work and keep working in the church too. To mind your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Walk properly. What he's telling them there is that they should be about business, letter B, and not a busybody. What happens when people are idle is they get, them, they get their nose in other people's business. They don't have anything going on in their life, so they're going to make sure that they make your, you're doing all what they think you should be doing. Again, you just watch any society that has a breakdown of the home and sexuality, has a breakdown of, of 
brotherly love and family and neighbor love and, and, and as the, the neighborhood goes, so goes the whole world. You, you, you find a people who want everything given to them. They don't want to work for it. They, they want the government to give it to them or they want other believers to give them because Christians are giving, aren't they? Yes, but God wants you to work. He want, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat, he said. 1 Peter 4, 15, he said, Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, a busybody in other people's matters. It's showing an example. It's not expecting a handout. Letter C. Showing an example. 1 Thessalonians 2, 9. You remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel. Oh, he worked with his own hands and provided for his own, own ministry. But some of them had, were sitting around waiting for the Lord to come back. Some of them were wanting other Christians to give them everything they needed. 1 Timothy 5.8, if anyone doesn't provide for his, own home, for his own, especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith, he's worse than an unbeliever. Doesn't mean that he's lost, but he's acting like an unbeliever. A believer is somebody who, who works, who, who, who provides for their family, who takes care of their family, who loves their family, who, who, who has things uh, right in their family. They're... They're loving right. They're living right. They're not walking in the passion and lust. They're not. They're walking in love and purity. They're, they're walking in the provision of labor. And then the last point. Paul talks about walking in the promise of life. Again, he's going to talk to them about the coming of the Lord. This, this is where, okay, they're walking in harmony. They're walking in love. They're walking in honest labor. Now he wants them to walk with hope. And I've told you that every chapter ends with the coming of the Lord. Because we can live right and do right and work hard knowing that there's a day of rest coming. He says, concerning those who are asleep, verse 13 through 15. I do not want you to be misinformed about those who've fallen asleep. And again, this, this has the idea of, Jesus said about, the, about Lazarus, Lazarus is sleeping, I'm going to wake him up. He died. Yeah, but for the Christian it's called sleep. Jesus said of the little girl who died, he said, she, she's asleep. And they said, she's dead. Even Daniel, chapter 12, verse 2. Many who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting contempt. Believer, you're going to be resurrected to life. To life. Uh, second Corinthians, or, or, or first of all, those absent from their body are, going to, are present with the Lord as a believer. That's from 2 Corinthians 5.8. I'm almost done. 2 Corinthians 5.8. We're confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Christian, when you die, your spirit, soul, goes to be with God, goes to be with Jesus. Your body goes in the ground and is awaiting resurrection. Remade. Immortal. Coming. We know that to absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He's going to wake all who sleep. Number two, Jesus will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Verse 14. One day when the trumpet sounds and Jesus comes back, he's coming back bringing with him everybody who's died believing in Christ. They've gone to be with Christ. Now they're coming with Christ. And, and we find that Jesus is going to bring with him those asleep in, in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, 
but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. We're going to be changed. We're going to be, if you're alive when Jesus comes, Christian, the, the dead will rise first. We will, he said, don't worry about your dead loved ones. They're with the Lord and they're coming back with him and they're going to be resurrected before you are. Change. So that brings us hope, doesn't it? I'm very hopeful because my mom is going to be with them in the clouds. And I'm going to go up in the air. I'm going to look for her. <laughs> I'll probably look for, you know, a lot of people. There's a lot of people I love that are there now. And you too, perhaps. Walking in this promise concerning those who are asleep. Letter B, concerning uh, Christ coming in the clouds. Verse 16. He left in a cloud, first of all, Acts 1, 9. When he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. He left in the clouds. But he's coming back, secondly, he's coming back in the clouds, Matthew 24. He's coming back in the clouds. It tells us, that one day Jesus is going to return. And Matthew 24, 30 says, They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's going to be a great day, isn't it? It's going to happen. This we say to you, verse 15, again, the third time he said it, by the word of the Lord. And you can be sure when the Lord says something, it's not, you know, people listen. No. When the Lord says something, it's going to happen. Whether you listen or not, it's going to happen. I hope you listen. I hope you let the Lord save your soul. I hope that you let him help you to be a Christian and to curb your passions and, and give your will to his will and let his Holy Spirit make you holier. Not holier than thou. <laughs> I don't want you to be in that. I want you to be holier than you are, holier than you've been, because Jesus is coming. Amen? And we don't want to be ashamed before him at his coming. And therefore, we need to be not walking in the passion of lust, not, but rather walking in the purity of love, walking properly in the provision of labor, because people are watching you. People are, are, are watching you. And, and if you're a lazy loafer, they're going to think that all Christians are lazy loafers that, that want a hand out instead of a hand up. You should be walking in that way of proper labor, love, not in lust. Love and lust, they both start with L. The one's going to heaven. The one's going to hell. I just made that up like that oh wait i did hear something like that in a in a brian trejo rap song didn't i but not quite that way lust and love they both start with l but one's going to heaven and one's going to hell now where am i at in this outline here um letter c caught up in the clouds verse 17 almost done then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. You see those words caught up? I've had people on Facebook say, Oh, there's no rapture. It's not even in the Bible. The, the Latin word right there is raptizo. Rap, raptizo. Rapt. It, it's where we transliterate the word rapture. What rapture means is to be caught up, to be seized up, to be taken away. Maybe the actual uh, English rapture is not in the Bible, but the truth that, it, that, it, that the rapture is in the Bible. Amen? It's right here. It's in 1 Corinthians 15. The Bible says that we're going to be raptured, caught up in the clouds, just like Jesus was, just like Enoch was, just like Elijah was in the Old Testament. 
We have the precedent that people are caught up in the clouds and then taken away. You say, oh, the aliens got them. That's what the world's going to say, by the way. The aliens come and took out all those troublemaking right-wingers. I kind of think that's what they're going to say. The aliens took them. Thank goodness. Well, we got to plan it to ourselves. <laughs> the Bible says it's going to melt with fervent heat. And destroy the fire. Go ahead, you can have it.
So I pray that you will help people not to take from this message to God who is full of vengeance and hate, murder. No, not here to God's love and be trying to reverse what the devil has done to the earth and the people of earth. And I pray that you will help us, Lord, to look to you. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, as David begins to play an invitation hymn. Thank you.